All right, everybody. Uh, this is Bookster Talks. And we're coming to you live right now, but you might be seeing us later. So if you are, spread the word that you saw this. Uh, we're going to be talking today with Lucy Walsh, who has a new book out, her debut. So we're going to be focused on that. But I also want to talk to her about the rest of her life, which is also pretty interesting. First, Lucy, I want to say hi. Hi, Edward. Thank you for having me. And hello to everybody watching and listening. I'm so, so excited to be here with you all. Like I said to you when we were offline, I'm normally on the other side. Yeah. I'm normally the one being interviewed and there is usually a rather professional person talking to me <laughs> and, and guiding us. So uh, sometimes not professional, but <laughs> right. So I may be uh, crashing us into barriers along the way. So perfect. Me too. Bear with us. So excited to be here and chat with a fellow writer. I just want to give a little bit of a heads up about who I am. My name is Edward Savio. I am an author and a screenwriter. I started out as a screenwriter first uh, with oh, wow. Disney and Sony. And um, someone actually you may know, Bette Midler. Um, <laughs> my darling Bette, she gave a beautiful quote for my she book. She did. We're going to talk about that too. I, really, <laughs> I was really very jealous. And How are you uh, involved with Bette Midler? I wrote a script called Swiss Family Rubenstein. Oh my God. And <laughs> that sounds it's fabulous. It's a three word pitch. It's a three word pitch. I knew that if I couldn't sell that thing, uh, I didn't know what I could sell. <laughs> yeah. But it was a it was a spec script and Bette Midler's all girl productions brought it into Disney. It was fun. It was fun to work with notes and things. Wow. Uh, but really I became a, a novelist because I wanted to spend time with my kids because I lived in San Francisco. Oh wow. Yeah. So, Lucy, let me give you a little, let me give your bio here. Uh, you're an award-winning actress and musician. And I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they say. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that is what they say. You've appeared in films and plays and on television. Yeah. And you've also toured internationally with your music, right? Yes, I have. All and... over the world. And it was kind of cool. Like, I, like in, your, in your bio, it's like Maroon 5 and One Republic which is yeah. very cool. And you yeah. also composed the score for the film Normal, which came out in 2022. Yes, it was a film that was done during COVID uh, by a filmmaker named Kasha Pilovich, who I've worked with several times. And they asked me to compose the score and it was the most challenging thing I've ever done aside from writing a book. <laughs> yeah, each time you go outside of what you normally do, I yeah. think you feel that. Right? I and totally agree. Yeah. Remember Me as Human? Yes, there is it is. Your, is your first book. And according to this, and we'll get more into it, you're writing or working on the screenplay based on the letters that your grandparents exchanged during World War II. That's right. right. Yes. Yeah. And the other thing I found interesting you divide your time between New York and England with your husband and your two cats <laughs> and and what i like about the cat part is that uh the names are gilbert and jessica daisy bing bings now there's a story with the jessica daisy bing bings that's right yes i always name my cats ridiculous names because otherwise it's no fun you know it's no fun to have a cat named like i don't know Bob. kitty Bob. <laughs> yeah kitty, <laughs> bob's Sammy. actually a great name for a pet um yeah but i i like Animals kind of tell you their name, and uh, she just she just came out as Jessica Daisy Bing Bings. Oh, why are there balloons all around me? I love her. Oh, that is an Apple thing. I think if we do something like this, we get. I mean, yeah, but yeah. my my cat before that was Ivy Sparkle Puss Godiva. So you know, I'm I they their names get longer and longer. <laughs> yeah, Godiva is that's my favorite. Uh, yeah, but I do, I do move around. I do have a lot of family in New York. My husband's from London. And so we spend a lot of time in England. I'm in Los Angeles as well. Um, but I like to keep people guessing, you know, I've had, <laughs> I've had kind of like stalker issue stuff go on. So I like to keep people guessing about my whereabouts, you know. I had a stalker issue. Uh, uh, Val Kilmer actually stalked me. Did he? No joke. Oh, that guy. Yeah. 
that guy yeah i started out being a driver for him oh, wow. uh, before when i was a starving writer working on this project helping him get to the project waking him up getting there because i was a writer at the time we decided to work out some ideas and he would call me whenever he was in town from santa fe in los angeles and just say edward I'm, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna wake up Sunday morning and be like, I'm coming to kill you. I know where you live. And I'm like, dude, Val, like, I'm, you're, I'm gonna be the Val. only regular person that has an actor or celebrity as a stalker. So yeah, that's a new one. I haven't heard of that. Yeah, but but I can't. But I do know that honestly, for actresses, musicians, people facing forward, it's a lot harder than for us writers in terms of. Sometimes people think they know you. They do, you especially know. today with social media. Uh, we have such a direct connection to each other and, and people know a lot about you more so than they did in the past. And I think we forget that we are public figures sometimes and uh, people have a lot more access to you now, especially since um, Ringo came into my family as my uncle. Beatles fans are a whole new level of mania. It's really wild you can't imagine having that kind of pressure on you all the time it's impressive that the people in that position are as sane as they are yeah it does it does really take a toll on you and and i agree mental mental health is is such a tricky thing for all of us and when it's amplified like that and compounded in your life being in the public eye it's makes it more difficult to be human, which is a big part of what my book is about. Really uh, growing up in the fame like that really gave me an inside learning ground to really be able to talk about what it means to embrace our humanity, because we're all the same on a soul level. Before we get into the book itself, I was actually gonna ask this later, but since you brought it up, if people don't know, Lucy has a famous, you know, parent, and you've had to deal with some things like privacy issues and, and without giving too much away in the book, cause it's near the end, but you were worried about how much to tell in this book. So let's right. first talk a little bit about the book before we get into this, because I think it'll make more sense to people. This is your first book. Yes. Right. How yes. was the process for you? The process was. Absolutely. It was like going through a, a, a tornado and coming out the other side. <laughs> As you know, I wouldn't recommend writing unless you absolutely feel compelled. <laughs> uh, it is an extraordinary thing that I've always wanted to do since I was five years old. And for a long time, I shied away from writing because I thought you had to go to some big fancy school and get a big degree as a journalist and all of that, which I had never done. And I have so much respect for the literary world and for writers that I would never want to just um, debutante, what's the word I'm looking, dilettante my way through it. So yes. uh, this was a 14 year process from the time that I interviewed my grandmother to the book publishing. And I really um, tried to respect the process as much as possible by, you know, I'm a reader, I'm a book collector and a book freak, of course, as all writers are. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's just, uh, I think having, having respect for the craft has been really important to me. And, um, it was very challenging. There were a lot of points where I didn't feel that I was able to finish it that I didn't know how that it was just too hard and that maybe somebody in the future my granddaughter or something might take the letters and take it over the finish line but um I'm so glad I stuck with it because because I can hold it in my hand now and speak to you and I think so many writers and humans no matter what your work is we want to give up so many times along the way and many times so many we times. do we do, yep. but I just kept returning to the work because you know how it is when you have a a soul desire. If you don't listen to it, it's going to start tapping you and then hitting you and then punching you in the face. And that got so annoying after a while that I actually had to finish the book for my own sanity, no matter what it took. So it was a very grueling process for me, but um, it's 
my proudest accomplishment. That's really great to hear. See, uh, for me, people always ask, could you go through the difficult times? I, I really didn't have a plan B. Right. You no, know, me neither. I've talked to other people, a Porter, who's a really cool actor and a narrator. Um, he was talking about this and we had this conversation and we were just saying, if there is anything, it's not original to our conversation, everybody, right. I've heard this before, but it's like, if there is anything else you can do, do that. Yeah, do, do it. Do not go it's into easier. music or writing or acting. Don't do it. No. If there's anything else you might be okay, happy with doing. That's right. You, you must, the only way you can do this is if it's the only thing you can do. Yeah. And, and you are, you are obsessed with it to the point of everything else doesn't matter. Exactly. You know, I mean, obviously family and friends, but, but this part of your life, one of the, one of the things you touched upon was also something that was interesting to me because I just had a book come out this last fall. I, I write, uh, mainstream fiction, but also with a comic twist and also oh, what's your book called? It's called the velvet sledgehammer. Wonderful. I'll have to very, order it. You would like it because it is fictional on the top line, but the bottom line, the background of it and the flashbacks, it's all based on reality. And wow. I went through some of the same process that I think you did, which was crying on the floor. <laughs> yes. And not only that, but this book took 20 years as opposed right. to my other books, which I can put out, you know, in like a year and a year and a half because, uh, because it had to percolate because right. it was very private. And you I, have this same thing. You did the interviews in 2011. It's 2024. Yeah. And this book just came out last week. Yes. This week? Tuesday. A couple Tuesday, days ago. This week. This yeah. week. Congratulations, by the way. Congratulations. It's like a real book. I know. Thank it's you. It's a real book. Like, it's, it's a so... real book. I put it on my bookshelf with all the others. And I've dreamt of that for since I was five years old. It's so wild. And I'll tell you what's also cool. Because as a screenwriter, I didn't have any fans. I mean, I had fans at Disney. I had sure. fans at Sony, right? I had fans right. at Fox. When you actually have a real person read your book and then either laugh or they cry or it touched them in some way and they reach out to you, I still, I am still in contact with the first 10 or 15 people that have done that. They've been yeah. fantastic uh, support system for me. I don't know how to describe it. You've probably felt it a little bit with music, but when one person reaches out to you and tells you how your book touched that one person, it's a yeah. different experience. And I'm looking, and I'm really so is. grateful that you're going to have that experience. Yeah. I mean, it's been happening, um, already and it's, it's extraordinary. And that's what makes it all worth it. Right. Is if you can change one person's heart and help them in some way, you're like, okay, that's all I need. Like that's worth more than any money I could ever make. And it's, it's just, it's what it's all about. I agree. Do you want to tell people what the book is? Like, what is the book to you? Yeah, so I would say it falls into the category of of a memoir, as as cringy as that can can be. That um, you know, category. Yeah, I didn't mean for it to be about my life, but it started because um, when I was seventeen, my grandmother Wanda gave me the sixty three remaining love letters that Dale had written to her during World War II, as you said. I have one of them here. Uh, written um, January 14th, 1945. And um, they're just extraordinary. And I knew that I wanted to turn them into a film someday, but I didn't know how to do that. I was only 17. And so I started asking questions of my grandparents. And my grandfather died of Alzheimer's before I really got a chance to speak with him. And uh, that that really scared me and I think got me asking a lot more questions to try to, 
me Alzheimer's, you know, to like yep. get all the memories yep. I could so that Alzheimer's couldn't win again. And that led me to interviewing my grandmother in her nursing home when she was 97. And we sat for three days and I filmed it. And I asked her questions about the letters and she told me about her life and she told me very vulnerable things. I mean, they're all in the book. And her point at the end of it was, tell the truth. I want to be remembered as human. And that's a 97 year old. That's her final wish because she, she died a few months later. And that's what it's all about to me. That's why this book is for everyone, not just me. I've yeah. said a few times that I think, and this is not something I created. I heard somebody else say it, that I think the most generous thing that we can do as humans for each other is to compare notes uh, about what it is to be human and, and how to embrace that, knowing that we're going to die. That takes a lot of courage, embracing life, knowing we're going to lose it. And I think that this book is is my contribution of the notes I've collected to this point and from the mouth of my 97 year old grandmother as well. So I hope that people um, can, can, you know, take something from it and, and, and it'll help them in their journey as well. Yeah. I was, uh, I was surprised by it um, in a lot of ways. Like you, you did a bunch of things that um, were, I think you you did some unique things where you basically give an unvarnished portrayal of the conversation you had. Right. But then you also give this what you just said now, which is what did you take away from this? I'm sure you made editorial decisions on what went in and what didn't. Was this uh visceral reaction I had to the conversation you and your grandmother were having? You know. Uh, yeah. I've had conversations. My mom just passed away last year. Oh, I'm so um, sorry. That is... You know, it's hard, you know, and it was, uh, it was, but we knew kind of like in your same situation, you knew what was happening and you get to talk out some things and you get to, you get to hear a little bit of advice. Now, one of the things that I think you just spoke about, which is, comparing notes yeah i think that's a fantastic way to put it most people and i know my kids don't do this they 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 almost listen to some of the things that i say and one of the things that i can tell anybody out there and i think it was a learned experience from your book too which is go out and talk to the people who are doing the things that you've done or living the life in the way that you want to live it yes. and ask them questions about how they're doing it. And it can be from the social side to the business side. I, when I first worked with a writing partner, I normally write by myself. When I first worked with a writing partner, a very good friend of mine, I didn't know how to do it. Mm. So I went and talked with uh, Lowell Gantz and Babalu Mandel and, I got a meeting with them, the guys who wrote Splash and all these other, you know, Ron Howard comedies. And yeah, I said, how the hell do you guys do this? Yeah. And they sat me down and, and they did that. And one of the things that I want to ask you is like, you said, oh, I was 17. I didn't know how to write a screenplay or write a book. One of the things I think people can do is there's, you got to read them. You know, you got to read books to write books. You got to read screenplays to write screenplays. You do. You got to watch movies to write screenplays, but you got to read the screenplay. You got to see how what they, what is there yeah. is down here. Absolutely. And, you know, what I think you did really well and what touched me was you take away that it, I felt like at first you were trying to get this recording done. You were trying to go there for this, this thing you were doing, and it was about the recording at first. Yeah, that was it. Was, it was about this thing. And it, then it became something else, not only That's during right. the moment, but then what you discovered afterward over the years as you sifted through what you had recorded. 
Absolutely. That's exactly right. I didn't plan on it being a book. I didn't know what I was going to do with it. I just felt that I needed to speak with her and I needed to document it. I didn't know what I would do with it later. You're exactly right. And uh, yeah, I mean, you said it perfectly. You said something I wanted to 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 talk about, but um, it's about I'll remember. Doing, about talking to people or, or modeling, you know, <laughs> I'll remember it. Yes. But this everything you're saying cut out later. Uh, <laughs> yes, this will be the end. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, I didn't know what the hell to do. And so I think you got it in the creative process. Just work with what you've got in the moment. Yes. You might not have all the pieces, but whatever's making sense at the time, that's what you go with. And that'll lead you um, to where you're supposed to get to and what what's coming next. And I knew that I wasn't a, like a, a schooled writer. I am an avid reader, but I knew I wasn't an expert in the literary field, but I did know that I was an expert at being human. And I trusted that. And I thought, okay, all I've got to do is tell the truth and stick to the truth because I know how to do that. And that's what we all resonate with. And like you said, you had a visceral experience when you were reading the book. That's the biggest compliment you could give me because that means that I was right to trust what I knew I was good at, which was talking about the truth of what it is, you know, to be a human and blah, blah, blah. But that's what we feel in our core when we read yeah. it. I think that what you did was that you set up who your grandmother was um, and then her words got filtered, not filtered, but you gave us the setup to understand what she was talking about. And by the way, uh, we did have, it was very strange and you may feel, I didn't feel this, but so I had kind of like broken down the book and sent it to other people so we could look at what questions I might ask or, or things like that. And, um, some people were like, they were like, oh, you should send out a trigger warning. There's things about rape mm -hmm. in here. And, mm -hmm. and I think you did a, first of all, I think you did an amazing job with how you treated that. So, um, it's not about the graphicness of anything, but right. it's about how this shit happens yes in the real world far and, more than we wish to uh discuss yeah. including and, the other things that i discussed which are in every family in mine particularly in this book i touch on rape and suicide and molestation and alcoholism and mental illness and i don't believe in trigger warnings because i think this is all part of being human and we can handle it and we need to be able to have these conversations without people losing their minds because it's very very common and when we don't have these conversations when we cut them off and make them out of bounds we isolate ourselves from each other and it's it's a very um depressing way to live so i stand for having open conversation about the tough things because we've all yeah. experienced it in some way i have kids in, in i have two kids in in their early 20s and they they understand this whole trigger warning issue with right. people and friends. And I think that the best way that I heard the, the compromise way that I think anybody who feels either on either side of this is let's have the conversation. Let's make sure that somebody's prepared to hear it. But I think you, for you in this book, this was very honest and truthful. And part of what you know, I had to deal with when I was writing Velvet Sledgehammer was not so much about other people. It was about my, you know, the, the lead character is a fictional version of me in the present, but it's really a lot about me in the past and how I dealt with people and my relationships and need to be real about it. And, you know, I thought that people would, would be upset with me 
about saying some of the things that I said about relationships and how, you know, I, I don't, I try to see things from a, a as much of a, a, a balanced position, right? Not of just course, a yes. version, but yeah. trying to look through the other eyes, but yes, we do have it's to very have, important. it is, but we have to have conversations where we, we tell the truth because yes. I've used the analogy where, um, if we always put, you know, training wheels on the bikes, right. We never learn how to ride a bike. That's really. exactly I mean, right. Sure, we get around. Been running rampant for a long time, and it's a problem that we need to deal with and face. And I hope that more people tell their stories. And I appreciate when people tell it in a way that is relatable. Absolutely, and and I agree with you. I think you always have to be gentle. You know, as much as I say, yes. I don't, I don't really. Um, believe in trigger warnings myself personally it doesn't mean that i think you know you just blatantly say right. things in a way that's hurtful or, or scary i that's think right. there's a way to uh be soft about it and gentle because we all need tenderness when we are having these conversations but i think you're so right it is about keeping an open mind and being uh willing to see where someone else is coming from and how they might feel about something and it's so personal for each of us all of these things that make us human there's no right way or one way to yep. do any of it and yeah i agree with you so is there anything else you wanted to say about the book itself before we kind of go on to anything else in your life no i'm i'm good on that uh thank you you're this is a wonderful conversation you ask very smart questions <laughs> well i really did enjoy the book and you know i i think that as <laughs> um you know it's hard to go and find i like to read but it's hard to find time to read because then as soon as sure. i start reading something i start wanting to write uh, you know, <laughs> i start funny. reading someone else's stuff and i go oh i'm just gonna that's, write that was, that's I was like so oh, that was a funny. good sentence i'm gonna write i need to go write that's hilarious so you can't just you can't just read as like you know uh, the the audience you you have it, it derails your entire schedule because <laughs> going to a movie is like everybody else is like oh this is great let's go eat dinner i'm like okay i gotta go back i know let see there's that one scene there's that one scene that i literally um can't uh yeah I know it's like he is an actress. I'm like, I can't just watch a movie. I'm like, I gotta, I gotta call my agent right now. I can't, I can't, I can't, you know, <laughs> I gotta get on, I gotta get on a set. <laughs> so I'm just being told by our producers, uh, to mention that we're going to be taking questions from the audience and yeah. you guys should put your questions wherever you are watching this live right now, but we're going to talk a little bit more so we can give people a chance to write those questions. Uh, so Lucy, I am a closet air guitarist. Are you? Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm a. a what do you do? You play? Do you play just play? air guitar? No real guitar? Are you a musician? I I I, I play an open G guitar every once nice. in a while. You know, that's all you need. Open, that's that's all you'd you be need. shocked at how many people have made millions from just that open G. Open, I'm an open G, but but uh, one of the things. Um, I like I'm in my studio right now. I have my writing area over there. I have to have my own floor wherever I've been. Yeah. And that's because I walk around and I talk to myself and I'll act out parts. Right. You know. Oh my gosh. And I look like a crazy person. I would I, love I to see like, footage of this. Oh, it's yeah, it's probably out there. Um you can ask my family. I'm sure they'll send it to you. Uh so <laughs> Yes, for... I am a musician to answer your question. I play what piano you... and I'm nice. a singer. Um, I'm trained classically, but I've toured a bunch with pop artists and had my own record deals as a pop artist. So it's all, it all feeds into itself, you know? So that is one of those things. Like I, in order, I tell people that you have to add to my uh, fairly good take as a writer, as a, a earnings. But you also have to add on to those earnings the amount of psychological help I probably didn't have to pay for because I wrote. 
It's got to exactly. be in the 500000 It's got to be close to $500,000. It's so true. I mean, and here's a trigger warning, okay, guys? This is on, uh, I guess, violence. This is why you don't see artists walking into public places and shooting them up because we've got an outlet with our creation and it really, really helps that mental health extraordinarily. It's an outlet and we all need enough. an outlet. We do. So for you, music is part of your family. Um, you know, you, you have, um, you have done this for a long time. Is that your first love? And then, but now you've, want to tell your story in a different way? No, acting is actually my first love. Really? Yes. Music was always a just, I was born into it. It's in my blood. My so, dad played classical music on my mom's belly when she was pregnant with me. And then I was born at home with a midwife and no drugs. Thank you. you thank you, mother. Up. I know. And my dad took me into his studio and turned on classical music again like the moment i was born and i'm so grateful to him because that's such an incredible gift to give somebody and there people family friends always make a joke like couldn't you have played or something some kind of music that you can actually make money with like why did it have to be classical why couldn't you play or something that you can actually go make a living at <laughs> but well, there's yeah, a living and there's a living there's, yeah. yeah, but yeah. acting. So that's interesting because one of the great things I, I then I bow down to you because acting. I appreciate actors so much because for me, I could be anybody. I could be a man, a woman. Uh, I could weigh forty pounds. I could weigh two hundred and fifty or yeah, three hundred pounds, and I can write a book or a movie about an action star, about teenage uh, angst and comedy. But as an actor, you've got to be the part. So you have to be, sure. you know, you can play other people, you can inhabit other roles, but you've, it's, and, and it's a little bit different. How does that process work for you? Like, how did that, like, how did you feel? Uh, that process? I always was drawn to acting because it, it, to me, it was a way where I didn't have to choose just one thing to spend my life on. I could be all of it. I could do it all. I could be an astronaut on Monday, a nun on Tuesday, a prostitute on Wednesday, the president on Thursday, you know, and, and die on Friday and come back to life on Saturday. To me, it is my connection to God, I feel most connected to whatever you want to call it. I call it the universe. And it is the it my partner. I, that's what she's that's how she feels, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's different for all of us, isn't it? And um I just I had that thought even as a young child. I was like, I found the secret to life. It's acting. And I never have to uh choose. And maybe that came from intimacy issues and fear of intimacy and I'm never having maybe I have like trouble uh nailing me down but but that to me really made me feel when I'm acting I feel completely free and uh connected to my source and not afraid of dying I feel I think that's what creation creating does for us right it makes us less afraid of death and I agree. That's the one when I'm when I'm when I'm acting, I I can outrun my fear of death for that moment. And yeah, that's I how think I've always people, felt about it. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know anybody else. I don't. I, but more often, I think I think creatives think about mortality on a more regular basis like 37 to 400 times a day, uh, you know, uh, then maybe other people, I, I don't know that for sure, but I yeah. certainly know that we express ourselves about it. And I, and I right. think this is a way to soothe that. I do I'm going to, I'm going to ask one of the questions here, uh, from Christopher 
Greetings from across the pond and congratulations on your successful launch. I was curious, how do you think your background or experiences have influenced your writing style? Hi, Christopher. Great to meet you. Thank you for being here. That's a great question. I think my background and influences helped me just trust that like whatever I was writing would uh, work because it would resonate because I'm coming from just trying to tell a story, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, I'm not somebody who uses incredibly big words. I'm not uh, some scholarly author you know i'm just a, a woman who who dreamt of doing this and set out to make it happen and i think in that way i really pieced together a style that's my own and i didn't i didn't try to copy anyone else i just really uh trusted that the way i express myself would be enough and i think that's the key for all of us we try so often to emulate other people. And of course, we always do that because that's part of being human. We emulate each other and look for what worked and sure. and use that. But also trusting our own voice is so hard, isn't it? But it's but it's it's where all the miracles are. So that would be my my advice. Yeah, that is a good question. And I think it you're right. We have to take who we are from all of our experiences and gather them together. Yeah. Um, I'm going to get back to something in a moment, but I'm going to ask another question first. Right. Uh, Christy asks, do you think families, other families should do what you did, interview older members of the family to get their history before it's lost? Hi, Christy. I absolutely think that. I hope that my book inspires readers to do that in their own families. I I really stand for not taking each other for granted and being more curious. I challenge everybody out there to get more curious about ourselves and about each other because so often we take each other for granted and we put each other in these little boxes and we never look past that. And we lose out on so much to learn about each other and ourselves. Uh, when we die, the entire world that exists in us dies too, and it's lost forever. And if we don't really make sure that we have these conversations with our loved ones now, we're going to regret it later. And it's not that I got the chance to speak with my grandmother. It's that I made damn sure that it happened. That was, that was so clear. You were on a mission in the beginning. And like I said, it felt like the mission was even more important than your grandmother at that moment. It like was. You... And I, yeah, sorry to interrupt you, but I really think it was like a trauma response to the Alzheimer's because when that happened, I, I lost out on that yep. opportunity to speak with, with Dale. And that wrecked me. Like I was not going to let that happen again with her. And that's why I was so adamant uh, about it. And you're right. It wasn't, it wasn't about a project. It was just, I had to speak with her in a very, uh, um, official way. Like it wasn't just going to be casual. I sat her down and turned on the camera and I said, we're going for it. Yep. No, I, I, uh, I want to tell you, so my, um, one of my, one of my kids just sent some old photos. Yeah. I found this one picture of my grandfather. Oh my God. On his wedding day. That's 1931. That's beautiful. <gasps> and, and it's like, you know, besides the fact that the man has the biggest hands I've ever seen in my entire life. He really does. Five foot eight. <laughs> um, but, but, but I think it goes to the point of how we, we don't always remember our ancestors and I hope, I hope, that from this generation forward, that each of us, uh, even though we live our separate lives, is more like some other cultures where there's this shared experience between the family members. Yeah. You know, as much as there can be, even if we're in different places, you know, 
Absolutely. So, yeah. And especially as we get older, I think we separate ourselves from the elderly. We don't want to identify with them because we don't want to embrace our own mortality. It's scary. Yeah, sure. uh, but people, scary. people are, our elders do not lose their humanity. We don't lose our humanity as we age. We go deeper. We become more human. And, yeah, and, <laughs> and I think, sorry, sorry, go ahead. No, and it's not us versus them. I think we need no. to get rid of that thinking. You know, we're all in the, we're, we're all going to get there if we live long enough. And what are you going to do when it's you? Well, I already know this now as a, you know, I'm got kids who are in their, you know, twenties, right. Our, our grandparents, great grandparents, they weren't sitting around like, you know, like prim and proper. Those Absolutely pictures, not. Those pictures look like that because they were staged because right. they, they cost so much money to take a picture. That's right. They were out having sex. They were out doing yeah. shit. Like they were out like some of them were carousing. Some of them were good girls, good boys, whatever. Some of them were bad girls, bad boys. There's like all kinds of stories that we just think, oh, we invented this behavior. Exactly. You know? Yeah, it's even like if real. they were they were just like us. And even yes. if, to all the young listeners out there, you're going to be somebody's great grandparent someday. <laughs> That's all the crazy. stuff you're doing, they did as well, you know. But That's cooler. Correct. Cooler because there was no TikTok. So it was a cooler no time. <laughs> exactly. All right. So next question. This kind of goes to something that I was uh thinking about asking too, which is how did seeing your grandmother in the nursing home affect your attitude towards that kind of institution and yeah. elder care and how we deal with that? It really affected me is to, to visit my relatives in the nursing home. It was very traumatizing for me when I was a child. And I know most of us have had experiences in old folks' homes, as I used to call them when I was little. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's very upsetting and and disturbing and you don't know how to handle it or what to do with all that emotion. For me, I have now become very active in volunteering with nursing homes. I work with an organization no. called the National Association of Long-Term Care Volunteers. If you go to my Instagram or Facebook, uh, Instagram, the Lucy Walsh, there's a link to it in my bio. They bring in on a national level volunteer companions to spend time with elderly residents who live in these nursing homes. And you can get trained very easily online in a half hour program. You can walk into your local nursing home. There's one on every corner in, in, in every yep. town. And you can yep. sit with somebody for an hour and play cards or read a book or play music or just talk with them. It's not as scary as you would imagine. And I urge everybody to get involved. It's easy to do. And please reach out to me if you're interested. I think that's a great thing. I think that's great. And do look up Lucy um, uh, for that information. So this, I'm going to skip ahead for one question and then go back. Uh, because we kind of touched on it just a moment ago. So this is a question from Jazzy, but we, we talked about it, but maybe there's something else here, which is given the stories told, do you think the wholesomeness of years gone by is an illusion or is it just your family's history is unique? Hi, Jazzy. I do think that, that the romance of bygone eras is an illusion. Uh, clearly, I mean, if you read this book, my grandmother told me things about her life that are shocking. This woman went through more by the time she was 20 years old than most of us do in an entire lifetime. There was nothing romantic about country life during World War II and World War I because she was born in 1913. Uh, so, of course, things were different in other eras. I think that before technology, there were a lot of beautiful things going on that don't exist anymore. I think people talked. Uh, well, no, that's not true because people have always just had trouble talking yeah. <laughs> about the tough things. That's never been different. But yeah, of course, you know, the music was romantic and, and the way people dress was different and all of that. There's more formality, formality and tradition, right? And tradition. Yeah, you but know. as far as people being people, I I think it is an illusion, and that's really what uh, my my 
purpose with the book is, is to shatter that generational illusion that things were easier or better or, or, or more fun or more romantic or any of that. Humans have been the same since the beginning of humans. <laughs> I, I, I agree. And we see that in both good and bad ways, right? Exactly. We, we and that's, that's what the book's about is embracing that, that brokenness in us. We're not, I don't believe that we're broken, but that imperfection, that soft underbelly of what we are ashamed of, uh, yeah. that's what we should talk about because that's what we help each other with. When we're trying to be perfect all the time, we isolate ourselves and we don't help each other. That just leads to depression. And I think that's why suicide and depression are at an all time high because people are trying to appear perfect and cover themselves up with filters and pretend like they've got it all together and we're not helping and, each other or ourselves. Right. And then when you look in the mirror and you don't have the filter, or you don't have the thing that distracted you, uh, it becomes harder. It does. It's an, it's an important thing. You know, I've, I've dealt with, uh, things in my life. I had panic attacks when I first sold screenplays. Yeah. Um, I was like at like all of a sudden I've reached the thing that I've been working for. And my body was like, you know what? Fuck you. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to just like give you a, throw you a curve here. Yeah, the body will and tell you to fuck off. Yeah, it's like, it's just like, go, go. Your mind will go do crazy things yeah. for you. So just right. give yourself a bit of, um, give yourself a pat on the back for being human, for, for yeah. dealing with some of the stuff. And also for, you know, give yourself some credit for dealing with the crap that comes your way. And, exactly. you know, don't be afraid of some of it because honestly um making sure everything's like perfect and not like upsetting you it's exhausting is not, it's not only gonna it's not only exhausting it doesn't um it it's it's like toughening yourself up it's like the first time you go out for sports and you get hit on a football field or someone checks you you know when you're playing lacrosse right it's it hurts yeah and then you get used to it yeah. All right, I'm going to ask another question here from Gabriella. Do you think the process of gathering the stories for this book have made you a better actress? Hi, Gabriella. Absolutely. This book process has made me a better actress. I think it will really change my work from this point. I am excited to explore that. I think acting is just being truthful in an imagined circumstance that's what acting is to me and this process has brought me to a, a, a much more truthful place in myself than i was functioning from before and that's got to affect my my work in the acting so We'll see. I mean, I'll, I'll have to share whatever I do next and you guys can tell me if you see it. Yeah, that would be, that'd be great. <laughs> no, I, I want to check. In I'm joking. Watch my movies and tell me, you know, what you think. Hey, no, um, but yeah, of course it has to affect, right? Because everything should change us. Otherwise, why are we doing it? If you don't allow an experience to change you in some way, it's as if you never had the experience. And I did that for a long time. I just wouldn't budge, like, even, no matter what I went yep. through. And we do that, right? But I'm really trying to allow experiences to change me in some way. I think that's really important. I, I, am, I am often, I say this, I am a glacier. I move as a writer, I move in one direction, you know, unstoppably toward this completion of a project or the way that I see how I want this whole series to go if I'm writing a book series or whatever. Right. But on the other side, you must be the most flexible person yeah. as well. And it's very hard to have those two things be. It's, I think, the biggest struggle for creatives is that you must be monolithic and driven 
toward a singular goal in order to make it. There's just too many people in the world trying to do this. And it's so hard, even if, even if no one else was doing this, I'm, I'm not in competition with anybody else. I'm right. only in competition with myself. Sure. Even if no one else was doing this to get it done and, and live life is not easy. No, it's a hard thing. It's a hard thing to get this done. Uh, but you must be flexible too. So that's uh, a very, it's a very good thing. Learning from what we experience, but also having this basis of who we are. Yeah, that's a dance, thing. isn't it? It's such a dance. Yeah. And especially, I always feel this way for, um, and you can speak to this a bit more because you've now written and acted. The basic acting I've done was in college acting's a little bit different because you have to take on a person for a lot longer. Yeah. You know, true. you know, and it can affect you. Yeah. You live with your characters for a while. That is interesting. All right. I'm going to ask you this question and I, I pardon me if I'm, if I pronounce this name wrong, Aditya. Aditya. Beautiful name. Beautiful. I wish I could say it. I hope I said it. <laughs> Uh, Aditya says, I find it difficult to stay unbiased when talking about one's own loved ones. <clears throat> your book is phenomenal. How difficult was it to look at your own family history objectively and bring out the truth? Hi, Aditya. It was very hard to be objective and not try to protect my family members. I have to give my mother a lot of credit, uh, everyone in my family, because I'm writing about things in her family that most families wouldn't want told. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but my grandmother really told me to tell the truth, and that's what I wanted to honor. And that really helped me when she gave me permission to do that because I didn't have to worry about protecting her. And that allowed me to open up in the writing and go there. I didn't want to just write a book for the hell of it. I wanted to go to the truth of these issues. Otherwise, what the hell's the point? And yeah. her, her permission was so important in that because we do protect our loved ones, don't we? We protect them unconsciously and we, it's generational. We're all protecting these family secrets that, I mean, the people are dead who were there when it happened. It's like, what are we protecting anymore? But uh, like, for instance, yeah. when my grandmother talks about her father taking his own life, she was very worried. And she says this in the book. She says, I don't talk about this because somebody who knew him could still be alive and people are nasty when they gossip. And I wanted to say to her, Grandma, he died in 1940. Uh, I don't think anybody is, you know, gossiping about this anymore. But we protect these things for years without realizing that we're on that hamster wheel. Yeah, I agree. It's a, it's very interesting. Same thing with a velvet sledgehammer. I thought no one in my family would speak to me because right. I'm, I'm going back to moments and. You know, the first chapter is called My Father, the Ass Picker, right? I mean, so, you know, <laughs> now, and, but, uh, but it is funny about that, I guess. So I don't know if we're going to get to all these questions, but there's some really good ones. Okay. So maybe we can get through some of them quickly. Cause I think this was probably easy. Maggie asked, growing up, did you know how famous your dad was and what was it like being the daughter of a famous musician? Well, Maggie, that is a big part of the book. I did go into that. And so um, there's some good stories in there for you. But just to say, uh, I answer that question a lot differently than I used to. I used to talk about, oh, the, the glitz and the glamour of it. And yeah, yeah, it's yep. wonderful. But that's not a, a, a helpful conversation. So um, I talk about in the book, uh, the issues that a child witnessing all of that was dealing with, how it affected my own self-esteem. And I'm, I'm grateful that I've had those lessons. And I, I, I thank my dad in the book as 
my greatest teacher in this life. And I mean that. I don't blame him for anything. It's it's all things that my soul came here to work through and to understand. And it's been an, an extraordinary journey. That's that's another book. <laughs> that, but, that is another book. But I definitely touch on it in Remember Me as Human. That's very cool. I, I, I appreciate that because I think that's, it's, uh, it is interesting when we evolve how we look at whatever we feel about our parents, right. famous or not, you know, yeah. how, how we can see how much they've taught us. And some of the lessons they've taught us were on purpose and some were not. Right. Exactly. You know, yeah. this was, I, I like this question here. This was something I actually um, felt. I didn't write this down myself, but I felt this. Ashley asks, what was the biggest surprise you uncovered in your interviews and in your writing the book? The biggest surprise I uncovered is one moment that I actually write about where I asked my grandmother a very tough question. And I expected her to admit things to me. And she did not. She really uh, skirted around the issue and didn't want to talk about it. And that surprised me because I thought that at the end of our life, we are like willing to just let it all go and yep. have these big epiphanies. And I learned a lot about humans in that moment. I really learned how we cling to our our beliefs and our and our choices and we justify our choices even if they were 60 years ago because we have to be able to live with ourselves somehow and i saw that in her in that moment and and i wasn't expecting it that was a powerful moment for me that's interesting you know it's funny because when i read the book and i know there there were places where you didn't get what you what you thought you were going to get but I also thought that there was a lot of honesty that I thought surprised me. Now, when you read the book, you also hear how people spoke about things where they kind of go like this. They're not stand-up comics. Right. They're not telling it to your face. They're giving you information and you have to, you have to piece it together. Right. From what's going on. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There's a lot of... not being said as in any, as in all communication, most is all not being conversation. said. Right. <laughs> exactly. Okay. I'll go back up to Kennedy asking, hello from Oregon. Well, hello, Oregon. Uh, do you have any other books, literary, literary projects in the works that you feel you have a soul tie to complete? Oh, I love that question. Thank you. I know in that. Yes, the film. I am uh, in in works finishing up the feature film that's also based on my grandparents' letters. And like you were saying, Edward, how some of your works are half fictionalized and half based on real life events. This this film is different from the book. There's no granddaughter character. There's no interview. It's a period piece that, that takes place during World War II with the same characters, the same real life situations, but a bit more fictionalized. And I will not be able to rest until I get this film complete up on the screen. So that is my next soul's calling, and uh, I'm not happy about it. <laughs> Well, hey, you know, this is, I talk to my kids all the time about this. Uh, I always say disappointment and uh, discomfort is your best friend. It is. It's, it is. It's like, it's when you force yourself to do something. That's if right. If you're comfortable, it's like, ah, I'll write tomorrow, you know. Exactly. I think one of the hardest things for new writers, new actors, you know, people in the industry is to understand that uh, we don't always have schedules, but that's the hardest thing because we don't the have the hardest schedules. thing. The hardest thing you have to make your own schedule. And so you if you're not your if you're not kicking your own ass, no one else cares. No one else cares if you finish your projects. Nobody, nobody's paying attention. No one's going to know the difference. No. It's your life. And if you don't carve out that schedule for yourself and get very realistic, that's the realistic side about being an artist. You must, must 
uh, be your own boss. And if you are not good at that, yeah. you must find somebody to keep you accountable. That's why the power of writing down your your goals, of saying them out loud, that's of telling someone else is powerful because it keeps us accountable. And I find that that's a very successful action for me. And I'm sure you too, Edward, in uh, saying it out loud, writing it down, mapping out the goal, and then breaking it down into really small steps that you can achieve every day. And without that, it's just a dream. So you've got to pull it down into reality somehow. I agree with you. I, this is my mantra all the time. And I tell this, it has nothing to do with acting or filmmaking or writing. It has to do with life. You are what you do every day. Yeah. I say this to myself. I say this to my kids. I say this to people around me. I say, you are what you do every day. If you're an asshole every day, you're an asshole. Yeah. It's just, it's just the way you are. Right. If you're a writer, you know, you got to write every day. Yeah. If you're an actor, you got to be out there trying to find a way to do that other, you know, it might not be the acting of it, but it's the process of doing because you cannot be what you want to be unless you are doing it. Exactly. Every day. Yeah, exactly right. So, Lucy, I really have appreciated speaking with you about this. And I really did enjoy the book. And part of it was uh, a surprise because, especially as a new writer, um, you, you brought something fresh to this. And mm. I'm looking forward to seeing what else you do. Because you already brought it up about about doing a screenplay there's a lot of material here which i think can be mined into more than even what you already have brought out yeah absolutely and i'm looking forward to that thank you um, we're, we're we're close to being done with the script and moving towards pre-production in the next year or so somehow some way uh that's what, that's you got to do it that way. Yeah, yeah, I so appreciate you having me, Edward. This has been such a thrill. I'm I'm such a a, a fan of the platform, and it's just so thrilling to be to be here. I can't believe uh, you invited me. So thank you well, so much, and to everybody for the amazing questions. I want to ask you, okay, where can we find you? Uh, the book, your website, social media, any and any last thoughts. So please follow me on all social media. I'm the Lucy Walsh and the book is available everywhere in stores. If it's not in a store, ask them to supply it. That will really help order it on Amazon. And please, the most important thing you could do for, for the book and to pass it on is to leave a, a review on Amazon. That is so helpful. And I, I, I appreciate it more than I can say. So please follow me, keep in touch, read the book. Let me know your thoughts. I want to hear how it affected you and what it brings up in your own family, your own life. And, and let's just keep passing it on. Being human, helping each other get through this crazy, crazy life. That's what we're here to do. That is it. I mean, that is the goal. Yeah. We got to be human. Yeah. That's all we got. We got to do it. <laughs> we got no other choice. No other choice. Uh, <laughs> Lucy, thank you very much. You've been uh, a wonderful guest and you bring a light, which I hope everyone got. Um, it's, it's in the book but it's also here and I was grateful to see it live. Thank you, Edward. I can't wait to meet you in person and give you a big hug. I really uh, have loved spending time with you today. Thank you. Well, thank you for joining us on Bookster Talks. Mwah. We'll do the dating game. <laughs> <laughs>